So today, I want my favorite. Kasha varnish. Kasha varnish. It's real, pe- I don't think of you as a peasant, but it's real peasant food. I think of myself as a peasant, like a <laughs> farmer. Right, that's true. That's so, true. Um, good, that's, that's our introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone says that their mom is the best cook, but when your mom is Joan Nathan, cooking can be a little bit different. You called me here to make this show with you. Yes. Why? What do you want me to know? Well, I want you to know what you want to know, but I also want you to know our traditions and what I've learned through the years. She'll teach me from her wealth of culinary expertise. Traditions that have gone on for thousands of years shouldn't, within this one generation of just looking at now, be done. And we'll do like we normally do. We'll talk. A lot. And we'll have some fun. A Hasidic rabbi once said, forget everything, all you need to know is the food. (laughs) That's a good thought. That's what I want to show you. This is your America's Great Delis episode. Yeah. Of uh, Jewish Cooking in America with Joan Nathan. Here we go, let's watch. Second Avenue Deli is no longer there, it's a bank. Well, it's a different place. Look at, look at her hair. I love it. That's the stuff. But I think the way we make it is sort of the old recipes that our grandmothers used to make. Speaking of grandmothers, who's that? My mother. She loved There's Pearl. She, look at look at what an elegant lady she was. She, was. she did not like Kasha <laughs> Why she, not? I think it reminded her. It was probably the only time she was ever near the Lower East Side. Her family <laughs> left it from Europe. She said, "We left Europe for reasons." There she is. She was a character, Pearl. I remember when I went on a trip to That's the stuff, Kasha Varnish goes. And look at Dad's nice necklace you're wearing. Oh, yeah, I know. So, you know, here's your gram- your mother, my grandmother, your mom, but Dad's mom, Peshka, she was the one who made Kasha Varnish All the goes. time. And is that whose recipe is in Jewish Cooking in America? Yeah, I watched her make it. Yeah. So will you teach me how to make I'll it? I'll ma- teach you how to make it. All right. This is the most nostalgic dish when it comes to Jewish cooking I can think of. It makes me think of when I was that age. Right. Sitting for this photo shoot and grandma and dad's mom, Paula, making this for me every Friday night or whatever, every holiday. And she's gone now. And a whole generation of people who made old country food for for me are gone. I mean, even Mm -hmm. dad is gone now. Mm -hmm. So who do we turn to when we need, other than Joan, to have the good Jewish grandmothers of our world. I have just the person. Okay, who's that? Jake Cohn. Hey, Jake. How are you? Okay, so I told my son that we're we're making kasha varnishkas this morning, and I told him that if he wants a a Jewish grandmother, you're the person for him to go to. (laughs) (laughs) That is the most accurate description ever. You should show us a picture of your new cookbook. Yes. Uh, Jewish. Great. Jewish. Perfect. Do okay. you have kasha varnishkas? A new wave. Ah, oh, perfect. So, what do you have in it that's different? So, I, I just feel like it's always as this like deli side, and I turned it into like a weeknight pasta. So you just throw in a bunch of herbs and lemon. That is not the way that my, I I thought you were the the replacement for my grandmother. (laughs) At its core, it's fat with the caramelized onions. You have the the combination. I love that like juxtaposition between like the, the grittiness and the chew from the buckwheat to the pasta. I think it just works really well together. And you could just then zhuzh it up however you want. I'm, yeah. I'm curious why you've taken on this role of being, uh, you know, the, the next generation's Jewish grandmother. It, it's something that was a journey in terms of discovering like my identity and how I wanted to kind of have that relationship with Judaism. And so much of it is so rooted, like many Jews in America, with culture, food, tradition. 
every Jew, even including myself, that's secular, that's gone through like the bar mitzvah process knows the prayer for the wine, the prayer for the candles, the prayer for the challah. Um, and I know them all by heart, but I never knew the actual meanings of, of what's the point of it. And once you learn the point of it, the, the prayer becomes like secondary. It becomes more so that these are these beautiful traditions that are rooted in self-care and community and family. Learning about Judaism and food is what drove me to start writing my cookbooks. And I hope you've read some of them in your journey. Uh, of course, <laughs> you, that, you are it. You are it. Um, but it, but and, you know, it, it really meant a lot to me. I realized I knew nothing about, I knew about Jerusalem because I wrote the Jerusalem cookbook, but I didn't know about Judaism. And that's what I wanted. And I wanted to bring it alive to my kids. And so we did Shabbat dinners all the time when they were growing up. And it, you know, all their non-Jewish friends came over because they knew there'd be a good meal, right? Yeah. It's a wonderful thing for your life to, to create community in your home. And so that's why I think of you as a Jewish <laughs> grandmother. Not that you Yes, have, but that's it. No, but well, I think that's it. Or anything. Did you guys go through the history of Kasha Varnishka's? What like, can you tell us? It's kind of like another example of, of the evolution of Jewish food when it came to America, that probably back in the, in the shtetl, it was, oh, yeah. it was, it was like dumplings or, or, or some kind of fresh dough stuffed with buckwheat or. Don't forget before potatoes, Kasha was a staple. You know, that's what you would eat all the time so that there would be dumplings, Knishes, kasha knishes are delicious. Jews from Eastern Europe came to Israel and they went up north and became farmers. They would see bulgur and they would want to eat it the way they ate kasha. And, it's, and, it, and they did. So, Love it. And, and, you know, he thinks it's blasphemous to put mushrooms in it, but that's what they did to doctor it up to make it even better in Eastern Europe if you had oh, yeah. it. But not fresh mushrooms. If you have fresh mushrooms, you are really lucky. Well, what do you think? She wants to put morels in our kasha varnishkas, and I think that's a total I, faux pas. No, the literally the recipe in my book it's called fancy mushroom kasha varnishkas <laughs> because I think if you if you got it flaunt it like the, in today's <laughs> age, like why not? Why right? Not? Why not? It's just going to enhance the flavor. Exactly. But you know, he wants to get back to that real gritty taste. <laughs> of, uh, I, I want I want a few rocks in, the, in that kasha. But I do. You know, it's also like, um, what do you call it? Like uh, cabbage noodles and uh, poppy seeds for Hungarian Jews. It, it mm. was the same thing, pre-potatoes. Yeah. You know, just to fill stomachs. Well, speaking of filling stomachs, I think we need to start cooking here. Love it. Very okay. excited to see what you make. Thanks makes. for talking to us. And nice to meet you. Time. Nice to meet you. I'll, I'll never think of my grandmother the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Good. It's a sweetie pie. All right, first of all, lots of onions. Okay. So you want to help me cut them? Yeah, let me cut the other one. All right. The secret to good kasha varnishkas is to seal the buckwheat groats. You take an egg. What you do is you mix the egg, and then you put in, they get sticky. Why are we doing this? You'll see when, when, we, when I start cooking it. To, for, to seal the kasha. Right. And that's what a lot of people don't do. They also, when they're making kasha varnishkas, they don't want to do this step. So they just use um, fine kasha, and it's just it's all the difference in the world. Because you want that crunch, cr that nutty crunch. Mm -hmm. First saute the onions. All right. I'm going to use olive oil. My mother-in-law would never have used at all. She would have used schmaltz. She, she would have either used schmaltz, but so many people are vegetarians yeah. that I wouldn't use that. Okay. And so around two tablespoons. Yeah, or more. And then lots of onions. Okay. And I like cutting them in rounds for this dish. I don't know why. I just yeah. do. I remember when I first went to work at the uh, French embassy, in Washington right. uh -huh. as a chef. I was about 15 years old and I told you I wanted to be a chef. Right. You said, absolutely not. <laughs> and uh, I went to work for Francis Lerl, right. the yeah. chef at the time of the French embassy. And the first thing he said to me, he says, David, and he was, you know, smoking in the kitchen. <laughs> he says, David, we're going to work on your sensibility. 
thinking that the most important thing as a chef is to have a good sensibility. And he talked to me about, even with a soup or any dish you're doing, of layering flavors. Right. And that's where I think, instead of using like canola oil, you know, if it was chicken fat, you would have the flavor of the chicken in this right. dish. Olive oil, though, has got, if you have a good olive oil, will give a, a slightly different flavor, obviously, than grandma would have had, but it will give you a good base, and then you're building the onions and step by step. But there isn't much to this dish other than the onions, so you might as well have the best fat uh, to right. cook those onions with. Exactly, exactly. I was in um, the then Soviet Union, 1988, yeah. um, with a, f a, a group of food writers, including, that's how I, I, I think I knew Arthur before, but he was on that trip, Arthur Schwartz. But Alice Waters was on it, and Paula Walford. And when we were in Vilnius, we went to a farmer's market. I mean, a market, that's what this was. Yeah. It's an American term, farmer's market. Um, and it was in October. And the only things that were in that market were huge, overgrown beets, carrots, onions, and potatoes. Okay. That was it. Oh, and maybe some dried mushrooms that all of us took back. But that was it. And poor Alice Waters, who was like the f fresh food queen of America, cried after she saw that market. And somebody else who took photographs of the market's camera was stolen by the KGB because they didn't want, this was a food trip, this food person to see the lack of food in the then Soviet Union. I was playing Captain Hook, and I was going to be in this production of Peter Pan. So I'm wearing my Jinko jeans underneath this shot. The challah has been hollowed out on the inside. Because you ate because it? We ate all the challah on the inside for this photo shoot. <laughs> but then, the best part of this was that on Sex and the City, when oh, yeah. Charlotte converts to Judaism, she goes to Zabar's, which is on your TV show, and she looks at a close-up of this book, and then she looks at Gefilte Fish, and she thinks, oh God, this idea of converting to Judaism, if I have to eat gefilte fish, is going to be a nightmare. And I think you told me that a lot of people, when they first bought your book, they would just sit and read it, not even cook it. It's almost like food becomes an index to culture instead of just the recipes. Mm -hmm. Is that a conscious effort? I got a fellowship for the American Jewish Archives to go and learn about American Jewish history. So uh, I, I, I read as much as I could. I learned so much. One thing leads you to another and you start, and of course now with the internet, it's a lot easier than when I started out. Anyway, so here's our, we're starting to, it takes a while. You've got to have patience with onions. Right. So you and want to saute them or you want to kind of caramelize them? I want to caramelize them. Okay. Can you smell it, David? It smells like onions. Oh, sorry. I never was a clean cook. Does that look enough for you or not? No. A little bit more. No more. Okay. Let me do it. All right. And then we're just going to put it on this plate, transfer this in. You're going to put it right back in? Yeah. So, so why don't you just separate the onions on one side? And yeah, the why don't you do that? Side. Why don't you do that? Let's do that. Because one of the things that I've learned from your generation is don't use a lot of dishes. Now you've got to flatten it down. And, you, and we'll smell the nuttiness. You've got to smell the nuttiness. This is a gourmet kasha dish. So you learned this from Grandma Paula, right? Right. She lived nearby, and when she'd come over, she would teach me. And, and I, you know, I felt as if, in a way, I was born to marry Dad. Yeah. Because Paula... Not only, you know, did I love him, but I got all, she wasn't afraid to tell me about life before the Holocaust. Mm. And she liked Poland. She loved the, the fraise du bois in the spring, that's wild strawberries. And she loved, you know, the, 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 the mushrooms that she could get at markets. And, and she loved Zamosh. It was a very beautiful town. She loved her life. And, um, and I, you know, I realized I'd always thought that everybody wanted to come to America, and I realized they didn't want to come to America until 
the Holocaust. Before that, they wanted to stay where they were living in Poland. That it, they liked their life. So now you're good. mixing the kasha in with the onion. Right, and then yeah. we're going to put. Let's mix it up a little more. So. So you're pouring two cups of water. Well, I, this is vegetable bouillon. It's just but it's going to water add, with the bouillon. Right, and so you yeah, can we're you know. In flavors. So I, you want to cover it? Yeah, wait till it comes to a boil, and then cover it for about 10 minutes. And then this is starting to boil too. So let's put- I already put salt in it. Remember you threw it all okay, over Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so add this. Add the pasta. Right. For the same period of time. 10 minutes. Yeah. So both are gonna boil for 10 minutes. And then, yeah, then we'll combine them and we're done. Grandma would tell me that there was a moment that they had to make a decision. Right. And it was her sister desperately wanted to come with them when they were going to flee to Russia. And she said to her sister, stay with your parents in Poland. Um, stay with them. And her father said to her, if you go to Russia, your baby will die. Well, her baby died and her whole family perished in Poland. So this was what she was living with. And as she got old, when, when the kids were little, when Alan and, and then Sam. Sam were born, she had so much to do. She had to make a living. They were very poor. And they had to live under the pressure of a false name because they, didn't, they came under a false identity to the United States, the Bloomsteins. Um, so until she was older, when she had time, she couldn't think about these things. And when she got older, she thought about them all the time. Right. For me, this smell right here brings back grandma to me and her teaching me how to sing on the piano. Eufen Pripitschik brennt a feile und der Alif bis. A little bit of parsley, just to give it, I know you don't like color because you want it to be earthy. Put that on now or just for garnish? For garnish, but you can mix it. So now I think you can do this on your own? Well, thanks for teaching me how to make kasha oh, But you gotta taste it. All right, kimchi. Kimchi. <laughs> Delicious. Oh.